Good afternoon. So this afternoon we're going to talk about transcription from uh, DNA virus genomes with a minor uh, break in that when I just show you a little bit about how um, HIV is transcribed in cells, only because it starts as RNA, but it does become DNA. So why study viruses in terms of learning about transcription? It turns out, just like with DNA synthesis, we've learned an incredible amount from studying how virus genes are transcribed and what are the features that are important for this genetic information to be made into RNA. They have provided us with information about control signals, signals that are used by host and virus um, transcription apparatus to initiate RNA synthesis. And I want to differentiate between transcription and transcripts and messenger RNA, and I'll go back and forth with those words uh, several times through the course of the lecture. Uh, a transcript does not become a message until it leaves the nucleus. So that's important to know. Uh, viruses have told us about the nature of a promoter, what it is that's recognized for initiation of RNA synthesis. They've informed us about what an enhancer is, a DNA sequence that plays an important role in stimulating initiation of transcription. And sometimes these enhancers are very uh, interesting in terms of where they work and where they don't work. The first description of introns came from the study of adenovirus. And um, those studies, along with uh, other studies of the human beta globin gene, resulted in the award of a Nobel Prize for that work. If you learn about introns, you learn about exons. So the stuff that's in between the coding sequences of messenger RNA. And Finally, they've really informed us about how RNA synthesis is initiated. Again, like DNA replication, the single most important event in the transcription process and how it's regulated. Now, why is transcription important? For the most part, when a virus enters a cell, the first thing it does is get transcribed, if, especially if you're a DNA virus. There are a variety of chromosome-like templates, and that's an important consideration when I say chromosome-like. Um, they don't have all of the features of the chromatin that's present in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell, but they have many of them. The polyomaviridae, those round guys that had four strands of DNA being synthesized, for those of you who wrote two, um, have a regular array of nucleosomes on them, except for one area which surrounds the origin of DNA replication, which happens to also encompass the promoter for early and late virus transcription. And that region is bare. And it's bare, conveniently enough, so that it's accessible to the transcriptional apparatus. Adenovirus and herpes viruses, large and larger DNA viruses, have chromatin-like features without nucleosomes. That is, they have some protein decoration of the genomes, and we're not certain what all of it is, but it forms a chromatin-like structure in the nucleus of these cells. And HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, is transcribed from integrated DNA. So it's seen as though it's part of the host. And what we've learned is that this regulation of virus genetic information, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail, is strictly defined. Virus genes are transcribed in an orderly fashion, some before others, some after others, some very dependent on the synthesis of what's made before them, and some very dependent on the synthesis of DNA. So there are certain signposts and triggers um, in the replication cycle that allow for transcription to be regulated. So, as I've told you, and I will tell you again and again, it's primarily controlled by initiation. It's about the host RNA polymerase finding a core promoter sequence and whatever it is that drags it there that allows for initiation of transcription. There are instances where elongation is a rate-controlling step, but those are actually quite rare. 
It's a multi-step process and it allows for other opportunities for control. That is, you have initiation, you have recognition, recognition of the promoter, you have initiation of transcription, you have elongation, you have processing of RNAs, and you have export. As I've said, there's a specificity towards this initiation process, and sometimes that's governed just by the DNA sequence that's present in the virus chromosome, and sometimes by something that the virus brings in with it to help it locate those genes that need to be transcribed first. Termination is a rather simple event in both ca both, most cases, and that is that both the RNA polymerase and the RNA are released from the template, and that seems to be a uh, simultaneous event. Now, just like DNA replication, the steps in transcription follow an orderly cascade. There's promoter recognition, just like finding the origin. There's the formation of a pre-initiation complex. Think of it as loading up all those proteins and opening up the helix. There's initiation, which has site specificity. That is, there are certain sequences within the promoters or adjacent to the promoters of genes and virus chromosomes that are seen by the transcriptional apparatus. And then we have elongation and subsequently termination. What happens to RNA transcripts? Again, the stuff that's made in the nucleus. One of the events that occurs right after transcription begins is that the RNA gets capped and it has this unusual five prime, five prime structure at its five prime end such that instead of having a free five prime phosphate, it has a uh, methyl, seven methyl guanosine at the end. So there's a seven methyl guanosine triphosphate that is linked to the, um, uh, the last transcribed or the first transcribed uh, base. These RNA transcripts are polyadenylated. So after they get transcribed, there's a sequence that is recognized that allows a poly A signal to be added to the end and the um, polymerase drops off. During the course of transcription and afterwards, so at both points um, in the transcription process, RNAs can be spliced. Intervening sequences are removed from a larger pre-RNA, sometimes called heterogeneous nuclear RNA. RNAs can also be edited. Just like any good manuscript that you write, you always go back and you change it. And in this case, there are tools for changing the RNA sequence. RNA gets transported. It leaves the nucleus. So that transcript goes out of the nucleus, and now it's messenger RNA. It's available in the cytoplasm for being translated by the host uh, polyribosomal uh, translation apparatus. Once you leave the nucleus and you enter the cytoplasm, the RNAs can decay. And the T1 half, or the half time, or the half life of any RNA is critical towards its abundance, to how much it accumulates in the course of a virus infection. And we know some signals that are important for regulating um, decay. We also know that if things are not available, that is, if the polyribosomes are not available, that messages tend to be either sequestered in some forms or to decay. And finally, we know about the mechanism that's been described recently as silencing, where both the host and or the virus can make RNAs that result in binding to the message, which cause them to be degraded or to inhibit translation. So there seem to be an awful lot of points of control where the message uh, can be regulated, both in terms of its synthesis as a transcript and then after it becomes a messenger RNA. There are three known RNA polymerases in eukaryotic cells. One, polymerase one, which is predominantly used for synthesis of ribosomal RNAs. And that's a very busy molecule because we need a lot of polyribosomes to make proteins. Polymerase II, which makes messenger RNAs and a few microRNAs, but very few. Polymerase III, which is heavily involved in making viral RNAs such as VARNA, which is a small double-stranded uh, structure. It's actually not double-stranded, it's just highly structured. Epstein-Barr virus encodes something that's very similar. 
and some microRNAs. And these guys are very important in regulating transcription um, and translation from these viral genomes. So how does the virus subjugate the host? What makes the virus different from the host chromosome that's present in an actively uh, or in a, in a configuration that allows it to be actively transcribed? Well, the first thing the virus has to do is get its chromosome into the nucleus because that's where the transcription apparatus is. If you're a hepatitis B virus, as you well know, you've got to change that incomplete molecule into a complete double-stranded DNA molecule. And then it's seen by the host as uh, a complete genome. Adenoviruses and polyomaviruses enter the cell nucleus. That is, their DNA enters the cell nucleus. And that results in certain sequences on these virus chromosomes being seen as being readily accessible by host transcriptional apparatus. And a variety, or in, in these cases, at least one very early or immediate early gene, as it's called, is transcribed. And that leads to a cascade of virus gene regula regulation. We'll talk about that in greater detail. Some of the herpes viruses introduce a virion-associated protein. So they came loaded, ready to work. They still have to bring that genome into the nucleus because the host's transcriptional apparatus, which is what it sequesters, is there. But this very unassociated protein plays a very important and interesting role in activation of immediate early herpes virus genes. For the retrovirus, for HIV, that positive stranded genome has to be converted into double stranded DNA and integrate into the host genome, where it's finally recognized that is, the long terminal repeats that Dr. Racaniello will tell you more about later, are seen as promoters and used to make HIV RNA, both genomic and uh, messenger RNA. So how is transcriptional regulation controlled? Mostly at the level of synthesis, by controlling the timing, that is, when various species of RNA are made during the course of the virus replication cycle and the abundance, how much. Each of these particular uh, control points is actually regulated for the most part by initiation, although abundance, of course, can be controlled by decay. So those are things to think about. Now, why do you do this? Well, an orderly synthesis of gene products allows for specific events to unfold. If you made the proteins for the capsid, all right, that shell of the virus first, before you replicated its nucleic acid or its early gene products, you'd have nothing to put into those capsids, and you'd have a lot of empty virions. Some virus gene products might be toxic, so they may be required for end-stage replication, but if expressed early, might cause the cell to apoptose, kill itself, no new progeny, bad for the virus. It's not it's not doing what it wants to do, which is to make uh, progeny. So this orderly uh, replication or expression of virus gene products is important to keep things from going awry. So what are these steps in transcription of pre-mRNA? And this is just um, a cartoon from your book, and the purpose here is to introduce you to uh, the various steps so that we can think about them in more detail, of course. Here's our promoter. And from that promoter, RNA synthesis is initiated. And what you should know is that many of the initiation events are abortive. They don't go on to actually make transcripts. The polymerase gets on, it loads, it starts to synthesize, and it frequently falls off. So elongation is frequently terminated. So as the polymerase moves down the template, nascent RNA is extruded, the five prime end is modified, and it continues to add nucleotides to the growing chain. At some point, a signal is reached at the three prime end of the gene, and that signal allows for polyadenylation to occur, the polymerase falls off, and the transcript is released into the nucleus. The transcriptional machinery is recycled, and the transcript is decorated as it must be spliced 
as it may be, not all viral transcripts are spliced, and it leaves the nucleus. One of the interesting things to note is that in the course of replication, or in the course of transcription, this polymerase gets modified. And there are changes to the carboxy. Polymerase is actually a very complex uh, machine contained of at least 10, maybe more proteins in its core form. And that holoenzyme is modified by decoration with phosphates. That's very important for releasing it from the template and beginning um, initiation of transcription. So we've made our transcript. As we are transcribing our genes, we cap them. As you transcribe through, you have exons that bound introns. And in some cases, those are endonucleolytically cleaved, spliced, so that the two exons are combined. The poly A moiety is added. And this event, can, again, can occur during the course of synthesis or post-synthesis. And then this is recognized as mRNA and transported out of the nucleus through very discrete pores. There are some virus RNAs that actually contain introns within them, and they tend to predominantly translate only the first exon. And then there are others that have joined the exons, and you get a translation product from that. And eventually, those messenger RNAs are degraded. So what constitutes a promoter? Promoter is um, a piece of DNA. It's a nucleotide sequence. And it's composed of a core, which is the first recognition site for the proteins that are involved in transcribing DNA. So you have your core element. And you have distal elements. These are elements that bring in proteins that either activate or repress transcription. And depending upon where they're located, they can be upstream or downstream of the promoter. But they're sort of aids in abetting transcription. For most eukaryotic um, transcription units, there's a sequence about 28 bases upstream from the initiation site for transcription known as the Tata box. And there are tatalist-less promoters, but for the most part, we'll be talking about these guys. And that's a defined sequence that's recognized by a complex of proteins called TF2D. Some genes contain an initiator region. And what this does is help to specify accurate starts so that when you map or when you look for the 5' prime end of a transcript, sometimes you locate it at one point, and sometimes you locate it two bases upstream, two bases downstream. And the reason for that is the efficiency with which this initiator functions. These distal sites, as I said to you before, are frequently binding sites for host proteins or virus proteins. And they can bend the DNA, as we'll see. Um, and re that results in uh, activating to a higher level initiation controlling more initiation events. Then there is a sequence known as an enhancer. And this is a position and orientation independent DNA element. And what enhancers do is exactly what it says. They enhance transcription. They can be 100,000 base pairs upstream from a promoter or downstream from a promoter and still have an effect and a very large effect on expression from that promoter. They can be this way or that way. So they're p position independent and distance independent. There are some enhancers that are tissue specific. So they only work in certain cell types. And you can understand how that would affect where and what organs in the body a virus could infect. And there are other enhancers that are universal. That is, they appear to work in every cell type in which you can introduce them. So if you look at a schematic of a promoter, and this is our typical promoter. They don't usually come in these colors, but um, you get what you can. And we have our Tata sequence, which is located just upstream from the initiator sequence. And those initiator sequences frequently flank the start site of transcription, and that's the core promoter. That by itself is usually sufficient to be recognized by the polymerase machinery and drive transcription. That doesn't mean that it's very robust. 
It just means it can start something. There are local regulatory sequences which help to modulate the amount of initiation or the number of initiation events that occur. And there are those distant regulatory sequences that are comprise enhancers. And for every enhancer, there's also usually a silencer. Yes? So once you get past the TATA sequence, which is pretty religiously at minus 28, that is 28 base pairs upstream from the initiation site, it doesn't matter. It can go almost anywhere, as any way, and as I said, for thousands of base pairs. There are promoters in the larger virus genomes that are comprised of 1,000, 1,500 base pairs. There are eukaryotic promoters that are comprised of 150,000 base pairs. So what I mean is, like, say you're, you were told this regulatory sequence is X uh, promoter, X base is away. Would you be able to tell just by the number of bases away whether it was local or distant? Um, so th that's a grab bag of information. The question is, if it's 100 base pairs, is it local or distant? And in a strange way, that's a proportional number. On a small genome, that's not so local anymore. On a larger genome, yes, it is local. And it's in, in part a reflection of the distance between genes. So there's no, uh, there's no simple answer to that question. Okay, so we have our promoter, which has core sequences and some local regulatory sequences, and the transcriptional control region, which is, encompasses a larger area then these different regions of DNA are recognized by different families of proteins. So let's start with our prototypical virus. Its genome will enter the nucleus. Then accessory proteins, either virus or host in nature, will recognize certain regions in those chromosomes and begin to transcribe early genes. In the larger viruses, these are called immediate early genes because they have multiple temporally regulated families of genes. As a result of interaction of these proteins with the template, they produce a recognizable structure for the transcription of the first wave of early genes. And that initiates the replication process. Somewhere along the line, these early gene products come back and result in replication of virus genomes. That results in an increase in template number. So if you have 10 places in a host nucleus where you can transcribe virus DNA and you put in originally um, a couple of genomes, and now you make hundreds of copies of virus DNA, you now have a sink that is a physical entity that contains DNA sequences that are recognized by host proteins. So some viruses are regulated by repressor molecules. And as you titrate them out by increasing the copy number, you allow those that are in certain positions to be actively transcribed. So the virus is playing a game by increasing its copy number to allow for expression of later genes. The protein of interest <coughs> To us, most is Pol2, the, the holoenzyme. As I told you in the beginning, it's a large, complex assembly. It recognizes the promoter not really well, by the way. I mean, it sees specific DNA sequences, but it needs help. It needs something that helps to specify accurate initiation, and that results from the other um, DNA sequences that are present and host and virus proteins. It responds to both of these elements, and that can s either slow down initiations or speed them up. And its job is to synthesize de novo RNA transcripts. So we recognize the core promoter. We form what's called a stable closed initiation complex. And what that is is an aggregation of proteins at the promoter site over the core where nothing is going on. They're just sitting there. They're stalled. They're like a car at a stoplight. 
And then what you want to do is open that complex. And you open that complex just the way you open the complex with DNA replication. You allow access by helicases to unwind the template, and opening up that promoter complex allows initiation of transcription to occur, and the polymerase escapes from the promoter. All the guys that were involved in an e initiation event, and I'll show you that schematically, are left behind. It's the polymerase that's chugging down uh, the tracks. In order to escape uh, from the promoter, polymerase II gets phosphorylated. And that can be enhanced by virus proteins. It can be affected by various host proteins. But it results in promoter clearance and elongation and movement of the polymerase complex. So there's a very discrete order to binding. And um, I'd like you to look at this. I don't want you to memorize it because it'll change next week, so why bother? But here's your DNA uh, promoter, and it has this Tatabox sequence. And this Tatabox sequence is recognized by a protein called TBP, Tatabox protein. And along with that protein, a host of other proteins, TF2D, which is this enormous complex of proteins, and TF2A and these other guys come in. And they form this stable structure, bending the DNA template and allowing access of RNA polymerase. What you get from this is a closed initiation complex. So we ha again, we haven't started anything. It's like that car that, has, um, that stops the engine when you come to a red light and you're conserving fuel, I guess. In this case, you're conserving ATP and the energy required for it. So once you form that complex, you bring in other molecules, polymerase, TF2H, and these guys have this closed initiation complex, and then they unwind the template. So recognition is stepwise. It's a stepwise assembly of these proteins. They bend the DNA. They bring in the polymerase. They unwind the template. The polymerase remains in contact with the promoter, and you go from a closed initiation complex to an open initiation complex. And that's what allows the nucleoside triphosphates to be polymerized and synthesized into RNA transcripts released from the promoter. And so now the holoenzyme is moving down the template, elongating the complex, and we get nascent RNA being made. What are some assays for promoter activity? We use many things in the laboratory. I'm going to show you two in a little bit of detail, and I'm going to tell you why they're not so good. But they are what they are, and they are what we have. There's something called a runoff assay, where you take a template that you make in vitro, and you linearize it, and you mix it with a test tube full of enzymes, and you measure the product that's made. Nothing at all like what goes on inside of a cell. What it tells you is whether or not a promoter is relatively strong or not, but it doesn't have the structure of chromatin. And it doesn't have all of the proteins that are required um, to, for de novo synthesis. Then there's something called pulse labeling, which is very painful, very hard to do, but is the way that you look at nascent transcripts. And what you do is you add radioactive precursors for RNA synthesis, either into isolated nuclei or into whole cells, and you measure the actual amount that is transcribed from a gene using, uh, by isolating the product and hybridizing it to the template. And finally, we have um, the favorite assay uh, in the last 15 or 20 years, which are reporter assays, where you fuse a molecule of interest that you can measure, such as luciferase, which is a protein that emits light in the presence of ATP, to a promoter that you're curious about, and you throw this into a cell. And so you, what you're doing is you're measuring in vivo the ability for a protein product to accumulate. So it's slightly distantly removed from the actual transcription events, but it's um, with some caveats, and it's an accepted procedure. 
So here we have in vitro transcription. We take our template, we linearize it, we throw it into a test tube that contains transcription components along with radionucleotide precursors. We purify the RNA and we look for a product of the right size. That's an in vitro procedure. In the reporter assay, we take a template, which is a chimeric reporter gene. So it's composed of that promoter of interest and your reporter gene of interest. And you use that as a plasmid and you transform that into a cell. The cell takes it up, it brings it into the nucleus, it turns it into a chromosome-like material, and it transcribes it. You extract the product after a certain period of time, and you measure the amount of luciferase that's made. The true caveat in this is that you can throw in easily 100, 200,000 molecules into a cell, and how many of them are being transcribed. And you don't know the answer to that, and you don't know whether there are effects on the RNA that have changed the amount of luciferase that accumulates. But it's a means to an end, and it's one that's used. Further steps in regulating. We've said that you regulate abundance through initiation, the availability of templates. So not all templates were created equal. They're not all in the same configuration. They're not all in the right place. They can all be in the nucleus, but being in the nucleus is just a start. Sometimes you decorate coactivators, that is, host or virus proteins that are important for regulating these events. And decorations that we know about include phosphorylation, methylation, acetylation, ribosylation, blah, 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 on and on and on and on. But these things can make a difference. And sometimes we have the role of enhancers and how they change the rate of enhancers. Uh, initiation. Splicing is another way of regulating RNA. In the late 60s and 70s, it was first observed in cells infected with adenovirus that there were transcripts that accumulated in the nucleus that were as large as the genome. And when they looked at messenger RNAs that accumulated in the cytoplasm, they were never large transcripts. There were never transcripts that were giant, that were that size. So these were called heterogeneous nuclear RNAs, and through an extensive series of analyses, they were able to demonstrate that these nuclear RNAs became messenger RNA, but nobody could figure out how it was done. Um, sometime in the early 80s, a group um, in Cold Spring Harbor noticed that these heterogeneous nuclear, actually, no, that was a group actually here in Columbia, Jim Dornell, who noticed that heterogene heterogeneous nuclear RNAs had these five prime cap structures and a three prime poly A at the end. And then further studies by his group and others showed that all adenovirus late mRNAs, these are the RNAs that encode the capsid proteins mapped to the same promoter. And that was a very curious finding. Subsequently, it was demonstrated that all late RNAs have four parts, a five prime terminal tripart leader, which I will explain to you in a moment, and a body. The body is the coding region. So the five prime men all originated from the same place in the virus chromosome. So how do you get small RNA from big RNA? You splice it. This is a schematic of the adenovirus transcription map. So here's our friendly large genome. And what I want to emphasize now is this late transcription unit. And what you see is five coding regions. And they all originate here at what's called ML, or the major late promoter. What happens is there are a series of DNA exons and one, two, three introns that are removed. RNA is transcribed from here, goes all the way across, and then these RNA sequences are removed. So there's nothing left that's homologous to or could hybridize with that DNA. And the last one gets spliced to the five prime end of one of these sequences. And that's how these larger uh, RNAs become smaller. So the thing that you need to know, and we'll get back to this in more detail, 
is all transcription is dependent on E1A. E1A is the first gene that is transcribed when adeno enters the cell. Late transcripts have common five prime ends, and there are eight transcription units in the adenovirus chromosome, and they lead to unique messenger RNAs. So, here's the picture that um, won part of the Nobel Prize in the late 80s for demonstrating splicing. And what I want to call your attention to is these loops and how they relate to this DNA. So this is the template. And we're going to make a messenger RNA, messenger RNA, that encodes hexon, which is this green RNA. And how is it done? Well, what happens is the entire sequence is transcribed. And then the RNA that is homologous to this sequence, or that was transcribed off of this sequence, is spliced from here to here. So that when this RNA is hybridized to this DNA template, this DNA loops out. It loops out because there's no RNA for it to hybridize to. The same is true for the second sequence. So this is DNA that we're looking at, and it loops out, again, because there's no RNA for it to hybridize to. And finally, the third, this C loop, which represents whatever's between it and hexon, is looped out. When you look at any of the RNAs that originate as late RNAs, they have the same five prime terminal sequence. So this is actually something called an undecanucleotide, and it's identical at the five prime end of all of these uh, late RNAs. So when somebody asks you, why does the DNA loop out when you form a DNA RNA heteroduplex? It's because there's no RNA that's homologous to those regions of the single-stranded DNA. Well, you <clears throat> or you could just say it was spliced. Okay, so splicing is value added. Virus chromosomes are small, and the opportunity to make multiple proteins from the same gene via splicing allows you to expand the repertoire of proteins that are expressed. Introns provide numerous sites at which RNA sequences are broken and rejoined, so there's a complex possibility of arrangement and rearrangement. Splicing occurs without loss of coding information. Most splices that occur maintain the reading frame, so it's very economical. Alternative splicing, as shown for the adenovirus, splice to gene 1, to gene 2, to gene 3, creates new functional genes. And if you follow this argument, then coding information of a small genome such as the polyomaviridae, those five kilobase genomes, is expanded. So again, here's your adenovirus alternative splicing possibility, and you have all of these different proteins that can be encoded by the late uh, message. And what happens is, by changing the splicing pattern, you change the protein that is coded. And you can make each of these proteins by splicing the five prime end of this message of the heterogeneous nuclear RNA onto a different body. And the other thing that you need to know, of course, is that when you do this, poly A addition can occur at multiple sites. HIV does the same thing, except it requires uh, the step of integration. So you must take that RNA genome, you must convert it to DNA. Dr. Racaniello will show you how. You must integrate it into the host, and once integrated, it's a linear molecule. And it has something called an LTR, long terminal repeat, which is a very powerful promoter that's recognized by eukaryotic polymerases. And the first product that's made from the integrated genome is a full-length RNA, which gets spliced in two parts and results in the production of a protein called REV. And REV is a protein that induces splicing throughout the genome and allows for the propagation of other virus gene products. So this is not a polyprotein. It's not like poliovirus, where you make a single transcript, translate it, and then cleave it. You make individual transcripts 
with an exception, the GAG-PO um, fusion, and these genes uh, result from splicing. Sometimes it's not enough to have your own uh, promoter. Sometimes you need an enhancer. And the enhancer in the polyomaviruses is a duplicated 72 base pair sequence. It's found right around the origin of DNA replication, which, as I said to you before, is also the promoter for the early and the late region. This was the first enhancer that was ever described. And it works whether it's 10 base pairs from the promoter or at the other end of the chromosome, 180 degrees around. It's orientation independent. You can turn it this way or that way and get pretty much the same effect. And the amazing thing is that it works in trans. So it doesn't have to be on the molecule that's being transcribed. So what does that mean? Um, I'll get to that in, in the slide or two. So this is the schematic of that region, and it's full of, uh, it's an open DNA sequence. Here's the 5' prime end of the early RNA. And SV40 in this case, which is the uh, polyomavirus I'm talking about, has lots of binding sites, sequences that are recognized by various host proteins. And these sites encompass proteins that are found in different cell types so that the virus can spread uh, within the um, organism that it's infecting. So how do enhancers work? Well, what we know is that enhancers cause DNA to bend. And the reason that they work at a distance is because they can allow the genome to bend on itself and let these proteins, the enhancer binding proteins that recognize this sequence, interact with the initiation complex. And it's that interaction that results in higher rates of initiation. Now, you can see from this, in this case, this is actually, you would say that it's cis because it's on the same molecule. But you could also think of it as being trans because it's quite a bit away from the promoter and across from it. So here's the, pro here's the experiment that was done to demonstrate that enhances work in trans. And what these investigators did was to take a sequence of DNA that included the enhancer and measured transcription from it. So this is the intact molecule, and they gave that a number of 100. Then they digested away, removed the enhancer sequence, and were left with the core promoter. And transcription was very poor. So the enhancer had a great effect. It was 1% without the enhancer of what's seen with the enhancer. Once you digest that DNA, you're left with a region that contains the enhancer and a region that contains the promoter. Now, if the enhancer is truly a sequence that can act at a distance in trans, then you should be able to link it physically, but not on the same molecule. And what you did is, they did is placed a molecule called biotin at either end of these uh, two sequences. And biotin binds with tremendous avidity to something called streptavidin. As a result, you create this structure, which would block the um, transduction of a signal from this end to that end, but allow interaction between these two molecules that have been joined. Yes? because it's got to find its mate, and this is just a way of, this is a proof of principle. The question is, then is, why do you put them back together? Right? Yes. All right. You put them back together because you want to show that it works. The, if you just threw them into a test tube, you'd have to have um, a high con very, very high concentration so that they were close enough to find each other. It's just a, it's a, it's a game, if you will. It's a molecular game about putting those sequences close enough so that what they do can happen. <clears throat> so when you link, link them in this fashion, which, as I said before, prevents transduction of anything because of these large um, macromolecules that are present, you restore a great deal of the transcription. OK, viruses are also regulated by and regulate host proteins. So they use host and or virus-specified proteins to regulate gene transcription. They either encode these proteins, those early genes that I 
I just talked about, or they bring some of them in with themselves. Those are co-activators. Sometimes they bring in proteins or make proteins that change the way the host regulatory molecules that make, uh, uh, the way host regulatory molecules recognize promoters. There is cell type specificity that can limit expression of certain viruses. So a virus that will replicate very well in the spleen may not replicate well at all in the heart and vice versa. And this results from co-activated molecules that are either present in a particular organism or absent from a particular organism, uh, organ. What are some of the regulatory protein domains that are used to affect initiation and regulation? Most regulatory molecules that we have isolated and studied are composed of multiple domains. Domains are discrete entities within proteins that have function, and they contribute to virus gene regulation. Some of the domains that are defined are DNA binding domains, and you can see where that would make sense. They recognize a very discrete sequence in a promoter, around a promoter, and they can either silence that promoter or bring other proteins to it. Some of the proteins that they bring to the, to, uh, the template are activators or repressors. Sometimes they're molecules that interact with a host. So you can have a molecule that has a DNA binding domain, an area that allows it to multimerize either with itself or with a friend so that you get um, a heterodimer, and an activation or repression domain which affects the way a gene is transcribed. Virus transcriptional activators that we know about, there are those that are autoregulatory, that is they control their own expression. Once they're synthesized, their tendency is to is to silence the gene from which they are expressed. SV40T antigen is a molecule like that. The major regulatory molecule of herpes simplex virus called ICP4, which stands for infected cell protein 4, does the same thing. And these proteins are both DNA binding proteins that have multiple domains that do a lot of things inside the cell. Some of these proteins bind DNA, and I've told you about ICP4 and the T antigen. Epstein-Barr virus, another herpes virus, has something called the Epstein-Barr virus nuclear antigen, which does the same thing. It binds and regulates. The very small uh, Popova viruses have a protein called E2, which is a powerful transcriptional activator. Some bind host proteins. So herpes simplex virus brings in, within the tegument of the virion, a protein called VP16, which is a powerful transcriptional activator, and I'll show you how that works in a bit. And some of these proteins, such as T antigen, the E1A an, uh, protein from uh, adenovirus, and E7, another papillomavirus protein, all interact with a host protein. And what they do is they bind to a host protein, change the way it sees DNA by releasing a regulatory protein. And we'll go into that in a bit of detail. So, <clears throat> host and virus proteins interact with polymerase II to effectively regulate um, <clears throat> transcriptional circuits. There are positive autoregulatory loops. They alter the rate of transcription initiation, and these virus proteins can stimulate transcription. There are negative autoregulatory loops that repress gene expression. They do that probably to turn stuff off because there can be too much of a good thing. But the most important thing is to recognize that there are transcriptional cascades. And that is that discrete virus genes are made at various times. So they are activated in a fixed sequence. You make gene A, you make gene B, you make gene C. And for the most part, there are very few incidences where that ordered expression is violated. Later, when we talk about latency, I'll discuss something that's very controversial, which may or may not be right, but in which it seems like a virus gene product that should be made late is made early. Okay, so what about these positive and negative autoregulatory loops? What do they look like? Here's our gene of interest, gene X. It gets transcribed into viral uh, mRNA, and protein X is made. 
Protein X can feed back on this gene, bind at the promoter, and either turn it off so that no new virus messenger RNA is, is made, or it can activate by bringing many more cellular components to the promoter and result in more transcripts. So activation and repression. <clears throat> Cascade regulation is seen in a different context. Again, gene X is transcribed, its RNA is translated, but now the translation product feeds back into the nucleus of the cell and it acts on another gene family and it activates that. So now we go from gene X to gene Y. Gene Y is made after gene X, so it's temporally regulated and it requires the product of gene X, so it's temporally regulated in a coordinate fashion. X and then Y and then Z. Why do you have a transcriptional cascade? It allows for transcription in a reproducible and temporally controlled sequence and that allows the virus to set itself up to do what it does best. Replicate its genome, make capsid proteins, make new virions, get out. The first products are either immediate early or early proteins, depending upon the genome from which it's transcribed. And then we finally see transcription of late genes. The early gene products ensure coordinated production of DNA genomes and structural proteins. Dependent on early gene products, dependent on late gene products. And it turns out that the synthesis of viral DNA frees the template from repressors. Again, as I told you before, you have hundreds and thousands of molecules. They act as a sink for absorbing transcriptional regulatory proteins, specifically silencers, and allow less complex promoters to be transcribed, as it turns out during the course of infection. These activating proteins can induce transcription of host and virus genes and repress transcription of their own genes. So let's look at a couple of cases in a very simple way. The T antigen of SV40, a polyomavirus, is made as an early gene product. It feeds back on its own promoter and dampens expression of early gene transcripts. So less early gene transcripts are made once T antigen is synthesized. When T antigen is synthesized, as you know, or as you'll recall, DNA synthesis begins. That opens up the template for late gene expression. Adenovirus does it in a different way. First E1A is expressed. E1A then goes ahead and turns on another set of genes called E2. But it does it in an interesting fashion. It does it as a result of interacting with a host protein to release a transcription factor. E2 is an anti-repressor, and what it does is it relieves promoter occlusion of the late genes, and it allows expression of both 4A2, which is a sort of a late early gene product, and the late transcripts, and we'll show that in a little more detail. And then herpes simplex virus has yet another um, way of activating transcription. It brings in within the virion this protein VP16, which activates expression from all of the immediate early gene products. And then you get a series of immediate early gene products that are either autoregulatory in nature or extremely potent transcriptional activators, which force expression of early genes, replication proteins, and subsequently late genes. So what you're seeing is autoregulatory loops, control through release of a host protein, activation through interaction of a virus protein that's been introduced into the cell. Um, this is just a hit list of the kinds of or numbers of transcription units that are encoded by various viruses. A small five kilobase polyomavirus has two major transcription units, but six proteins are made from it. And they are generated as a result of splicing. So multiple splices allow for the production of T, <coughs> a smaller protein called small T, and uh, the various um, virion proteins. Adenovirus, which is 35 kilobases in size, has eight transcription units, and they encode 40 different proteins. And 
these proteins do a variety of things which include dampening the host immune response. The larger viruses, such as the herpes virus family, much larger in size, have 80 to 200 different transcription units. So human cytomegalovirus has about 200, encodes about 250 different proteins, and we still don't know what most of them do. But in all cases, the viruses specify transcription activators. Some autoregulate, and others just activate. Here's a picture of the polyomavirus transcription uh, map. And you'll note that they all start in the same site around the origin. In one direction are the early transcription units. In the other direction are the late transcription units. And the various proteins that are made are derived as a result of splicing of the primary transcript. One, two, three late. There's actually a little guy here, four and two early proteins, one called small t and one called large t. In all cases, they share the poly A site, and they differ as a result of where they're spliced. How does T work? It works exactly as it works for DNA replication. It binds to that area around the origin of DNA replication as a hexamer. And in this case, when the DNA is opened, it allows for early transcription to be dampened. So now you're stopping something. But as a result of that, the late promoter is activated. And the exact reason for this is not clear. But what we think is that in that core promoter, other sequences are now exposed as a result of T being there, and that allows uh, late transcription to occur. The result is that early transcripts are decreased relative to late. They're never shut off. They're just made in much, much lower amounts. In adenovirus, you have three proteins and DNA synthesis that govern those phase transitions from immediate early to early to late transcription. You must transcribe E1A, and you must translate that protein in order to get transcription of the early transcription units. E2, an early protein, is required for DNA synthesis. It's required to free up that promoter and the entry into the late transcription phase. And 4A is a protein that actually physically enhances transcription of late uh, genes. So here are those three proteins again. The immediate early gene <coughs> protein, E1A, the first thing that's transcribed. Once it's transcribed, it allows, uh, once it's translated, it allows for the expression of E2. This is a transcription unit. And E2 contains within its sequence a DNA binding protein. Remember, that's the guy that flips out that single-stranded region of DNA. The preterminal protein that goes at the end, and the DNA polymerase. And at the very end of that is another transcription unit that gets turned on, which is 4A2, which is very important for regulating expression of late genes. So what is interesting about the E1A family? Two transcripts are derived from that transcription unit, and they, because of splicing differences, and they have the same splice acceptor, but two different splice donors. So the five prime end, that is where the first cut is made, differs between these two products. And the uh, larger product makes something called CR3, and that's just a domain within this protein that interacts with the host transcriptional regulator called mediator 23. You don't want to know that. You just want to know that it does something to the host. And that stimulates early gene transcription. The other protein contains two units that are shared by this, CR2 and CR1. And these portions of E1A interact with two host proteins, RB, the retinoblastoma protein, which is essential for regulating the cell cycle controlling responses to DNA damage and apoptosis, and P300, which is another critical transcriptional regulatory factor. And how does it do it? Well, E1A doesn't bind DNA, but it does bind all of these different host proteins, and they stimulate assembly of the pre-initiation complex. So what they do is they bring these proteins to um, the various early promoters, and they help to promulgate closed initiation complexes. The other way it works is by interaction 
with host regulatory proteins. And the host protein that we're going to talk about is RB. RB is a large protein that's very uh, heavily decorated. And as I said to you on many occasions, it's responsible in part for controlling cell cycle. And it has something called a pocket. And in this pocket sits a protein family called the E2F or DP protein family. And these guys bind DNA. But when they bind DNA in the context of RB, they can't activate transcription. So they're prevented from being transcriptional activators. What E1A does is it binds in a site right adjacent to where these guys bind, and it pushes them out. So now they are free to interact with the promoters on the adenovirus chromosome in the absence of RB and effectively stimulate initiation of transcription. More complicated is the herpes virus regulatory cycle, initiated by a virion-associated protein, something that comes in with the virus. It's located between the capsid of the virus, the nucleocapsid, and the envelope that is acquired from the host. It activates immediate early transcription because it finds its way to the promoters of all the immediate early genes. So it controls expression of all um, immediate early proteins. And as a result of that, you get expression of early genes, DNA synthesis, expression, uh, excuse me, DNA replication, now expression of delayed late and late genes, which are DNA dependent in nature. And then you make more of this protein. So you bring it in to start the infection, so it's a late gene product because it's associated with the virus. It decays rather rapidly after it gets into the nucleus. And then more of it's made and packaged into new virions so that it can start the transcription cycle all over again. And we call that coordination, coordinate regulation in a temporal fashion. Okay, and that's just, you know, simply described in this diagram. And the things that I want you to remember about this are that the protein comes in with the virus. The capsid goes one way, the protein goes the, uh, another way. And the protein finds a host protein, we'll go into that in a little bit of detail, enters the nucleus, and now is capable of seeing in that circularized chromosome the immediate early gene promoters. They get transcribed, they get transported to the cytoplasm, and immediate early gene products are made, all of which, with the exception of one that we talked about before, shuttle back into the nucleus. They turn on the early gene cascade. Those transcripts go out into the cytoplasm. The protein products go back into the nucleus, and new DNA is made. <coughs> new DNA synthesis is the signal for activation of late genes, which are now transcribed. They do the same thing. They go out into the cytoplasm. They get translated. Many of them go back into the nucleus for the purpose of creating the capsid to enclose this DNA structure. And from there, this capsid buds out of the nucleus in a complex fashion and acquires an envelope, de-envelopes, and gets another envelope. But that's for another course. Okay, during the course of virus infection, people measure various virus RNAs. And what they look at is accumulation in most cases, how much of a various RNA accumulates. And you'll see that at very early times post-infection, two hours, only immediate early transcripts accumulate in the cytoplasm of infected cells. By four hours, many different portions of the virus chromosome are being transcribed and accumulating. And there's a slight but not significant change in the level of immediate early gene uh, transcription. And by the late times post-infection, the later gene products are predominating. Now, what you don't realize or what you have to think about from this picture is that these are RNAs that are accumulating. They don't represent RNAs that are being synthesized. Not all of the immediate early gene transcripts decay. Some of them hang around. Some of them are inefficiently translated at later periods of time. So this is a map of what's accumulating in the cell. I want to just tell you a little bit about this molecule, VP16. It contains a potent 
carboxyterminal acidic activator. And that's a protein that turns on transcription. It does not bind DNA directly, but for it to work, the promoter of interest must contain this DNA sequence. Now, contained within this DNA sequence is a recognition sequence for a host protein called OCT1. OCT1 recognizes, obviously, an eight base pair sequence, and it binds to part of this motif. But what VP16 does is associate with a host protein in the cytoplasm called HCF, host cell factor. And it moves into the nucleus, and it requires HCF to move into the nucleus. And VP16, in collaboration with HCS, HCF and OCT1, provide promoter specificity. That results in stimulation of initiation and elongation of immediate early transcription units. And as I said to you before, it's specific for immediate early promoters. So this is what I'm talking about. OCT1 has a DNA binding domain. It binds to a sequence within all immediate early promoters. Here it is bound. VP16 interacts with host cell factor, resulting in a conformational change of this. And now, this moiety moves into the nucleus, and you get a quaternary complex, OCT1, HCF, VP16, and the DNA sequence that's recognized by this. The interaction of these four molecules, if you will, results in potent initiation of transcription. Yes? What would be the R in that sequence? That's any purine. No. So there's, there's always some um, degeneration in sequence. Sequence specificity is a relative term. Okay, finally, the thing that you have to remember is that a primary transcript does not become a messenger RNA until it's exported, until it leaves the nucleus. Export is usually accomplished by host proteins, and the transcript uses nuclear pores to exit. But there are a large number of virus-encoded proteins that act as Sharon's. They bring, they bind the RNA, and they bring it across uh, the nuclear membrane using host uh, proteins to help. Um, this complex that marks mature RNAs for export is assembled during splicing. If an RNA is not spliced, then it uses a different mechanism. And these proteins that shuttle between the nucleus and cytoplasm and carry RNA as their cargo are known as exportants. So what did you learn today? Transcription is complicated. Not my fault. It's controlled at many levels. Both host and viral proteins regulate transcription, and they do it in many, many different ways. And that viral gene expression is coordinate, coordinately regulated in a temporal manner. Thank you. <laughs>